going to get started. Welcome, everybody, to the latest in this fantastic Corporate Leaders series here at Chatham House. These are on the record, so feel free to tweet and to, uh, to speak about everything uh, that happens over the next hour. Um, how many of you were here, actually, a month ago for Ian Taylor of VTOL? So some of you were. So we had a pretty lengthy discussion about the oil industry, the oil market, about a month ago. And we'll, we'll reprise some of that in a few minutes with our speaker um, today. Ian was very excited about the prospect of um, Patrick Puani being the guest today. And he said, yeah, he really knows, he knows his stuff. So we, 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 we will listen to what you say, Patrick, uh, over the next hour. Um, Patrick sort of represents that type that is, uh, we hear about they have in France that we don't quite have in the UK, of these people who straddle the state and politics and business. Um, so there was a, a, a time when he was actually chief of staff to Francois Fillon in the 1990s. That was before Francois Fillon was quite as big a character. As, well, actually, he's not that big a character now, but it was we, before he was uh, standing for president, but uh, back in the in the 90s, educated at the école, you know, the écoles, and so part of that, that path that I think we don't quite have here. Uh, and then in the 1990s, Patrick went to Total, uh, and by the middle of the last decade, everybody said he's been groomed for leadership, uh, and he took over as chief executive three years ago and as chairman uh, two years ago. And Total, of course, is a company, one of the great seven oil companies of the world. It's um, it's a company that also sort of, sort of straddles state and business because, of course, it is operating in some very interesting parts of the world where <coughs> politics and foreign policy and diplomacy are right on the front line of creating opportunity and competitive advantage. Um, so, Patrick, let's just start with a bit about the oil market because Ian Taylor, when he was here, thought, really, that prices is probably going to stay low for quite a while. They've actually gone up 10% since Ian was <laughs> sitting in the chair. But, but just, what's your, what's your short term? What's your short term? You know, it's true, but even the experts are always wrong in that yeah. matter. Well, I think today you have, uh, you have some strong volatility in that market. Uh, you know, the financial markets and uh, the operators are very short term view. The news during the summer have been good, in which is not a big news, in fact, because we all know that. Uh, the, the demand is seasonal, you know, in the oil market. People forget that. But during winter, summertime, you have more demand than during winter. And so during summer, we've seen the uh, indicators of inventories going down. Uh, we also seen some, but you know, I remember that in uh, mid-August, I think the price of the barrel went down to $44 per barrel. And today, 59, 60. So it's a huge volatility, 30% uh, yeah. in two months. So I can understand why Jan is cautious, yeah. like I am cautious. Uh, what is a little new is that what are the fundamentals? You have a very strong demand. Why do we have a strong demand? In the last, in the last three years, in these three years, 15, 17, plus five million barrel of oil per day of demand. The growth, the, 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 the growth of the demand is twice bigger than in the previous three years. Right. Why? Because the price is low. There is no secret, you know. It's a very, it's like in a school, you know. It's a commodity business. When the price is yeah, low, demand more. is bigger. Yeah. And when the price is low, you have less investment. And when you have less investment, you will have less supply. But you have a time effect that people forget. It doesn't take one, six months. It takes five years. So you will have less supply. And then the price will go up. And when the price will go up, the demand will be lower. And this is a cycle. This is exactly what we learn at school. It's happening. The difficulty is to know what is the, the, the time scale, of, of how long right. does it take. So today, demand is, is strong. On the supply side, frankly, we have this OPEC, Saudi Arabia, Russia agreement, which is, in terms of geopolitics, a very uh, new element. It's the first time in the history of the oil business that Russia decided to cut its production. And frankly, these two countries are not in a very love affair, generally. But there, for fundamental reason, because it's a lot of money, you know, for them, ten dollar per barrel for Saudi Arabia or Russia, when you produce more than ten billion barrels of oil per day, these are the two largest producers with the U.S. But the U.S. is not a country; these are two big countries. Uh, so there is, this agreement is working well. They are really uh, compliant. They want the price to go up, and 
And something struck me recently is that when the Kurdistan story appeared, some geopolitics, this Kurdistan issue is not a big issue in terms of oil production. It's only 500,000 barrels per day. Frankly, 500,000 barrels per day, even if it's shut down, yeah. uh, Saudi Arabia tomorrow uh, can just replace them. But I don't, the market reacted as if, again, the geopolitics became important. Maybe because it's another step of uh, dislocation in the Middle East region. You know, you, we are adding month after month, quarter over quarter, in other difficulties. And so this tension appeared again. Right. So this is a positive way. I mean, frankly, for Total, uh, my only objective for me is to continuously lower the break-even of my And what portfolio. is your break-even so, now? Because you've been, you, you've been considered oh, oh, very good at getting uh, this We are today. Uh, I will use the same language by my competitors. So break-even before uh, outside of M&A is under $30 per barrel before dividend. So our operations, we create a cash flow at $30, and in two years, it would be under $20 per barrel. We worked hard to do that. Every time you do an interview, I think it's lower than the previous time you did No, 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 it's just like uh, <laughs> some of my preferred <laughs> analysts told me you are too honest, you are giving the right figures, with including m and so forget the right. m and your competitors don't okay. do that. Uh, so so I'm just using the same refer referential like the others. What about the investment cycle? So Because obviously you've talked about this and actually, it was, it was spotted in um, agricultural products in the 19th century that, that everybody planted the seeds this year and then found there was oversupply in the next year because yeah. everyone had planted the same thing based on this year's mm. price rather than next year's. Because um, what, what, you've been a little bit more gung-ho, a little more willing to invest, I think, than some of the others through this, through this low price period. No, what, uh, what we say, which is I think, true, is that the right strategy in this type of commodity business is to be able to invest, I would say, counter-cyclically, right. uh, which is because when the price is low, you have two big effects. Uh, the costs are going lower yeah. because your supply chain, obviously, is desperate to have some projects. So, so our costs have been lowered by 30, 40 percent, even in some uh, conventional areas of supply, the supply chain. And second, you have some competitors, the independents or smaller competitors, who have more difficulties than the major companies. So it's a period of the time, of the, this low cycle is a period where the business model of major companies like Total can be more efficient. By the way, we have been created uh, in 2000, 99, 2000, when the price went down under $10 per barrel. And we have been created these big companies, in order to be able to be more efficient by synergies, by put driving or break even down, because the price was $10 per barrel. This is the history, why? And then, in fact, this model was not so successful during 15 years, because we have been created to, re to react at $10 per barrel, and the price went up to $100 per barrel. At $100 per barrel, our size was becoming maybe more difficult, because less agile, uh, you know, you have, uh, oh. and and in particular because the access to resource, which is our permanent quest, was becoming much more complex. The national companies at one hundred dollar per barrel, they did not need really to have international companies like Total coming in their fields and trying to be more efficient. What was what? It was not really important for them to lose five dollar of inefficiency or ten dollar of inefficiency when the price was another dollar per barrel. And the second is fact that we have many competitors, by the way, in the London Stock Exchange. We have seen plenty of small independents uh, being uh, created and uh, discovering all there and there. You have very famous names. Mm -hmm. I will not mention them. So in fact, at $50, it's, the competition field is much better for us. Right, right. All these nice guys, the small guys, have plenty of yeah. depth, no capacity to move. <laughs> the national companies <laughs> are desperate to find partners to invest. And so that's the right time. And this is why we have been very active. We managed to, in the last three years, to have access to five billion barrel of oil uh, and gas resource around the world. In, in Where did we go? We go to Brazil, because in Brazil, obviously, Petrobras, you just read the headlines, the newspapers, you know, Petrobras has difficulties. Let's go to Brazil mm -hmm. to make a direct negotiation with them. And we identified over the, over parts, and let's go to the Middle East, to go to Algeria, where we could find national companies yeah. which are willing to open their doors. So I think, for me, that's very important. So we didn't spend a lot of money, you know, to acquire these five billion uh, barrels, or the first four, 
we would have spent something like four to five billion dollars. So it's one dollar per barrel, which is almost nothing. Nice. Yeah. So and with that, what did we prepare? We prepare the future growth of the company. So the next wave of growth of Total will be based on barrel that we have acquired at around one, one point five dollar per barrel. So it will be profitable. And it's why and it's why my size there matters. I can do it, we can do it, because we have a big balance sheet. And it's why the priority when the price went down, my priority and with my CFO was really to take care of the balance sheets, to deliver the company as much as we can yeah. in order to be able to use this uh, capacity to have access to new resources. Of course, over the next decade or two, we know developments in, well, the internal combustion engine is going to be phased out in, in France, Britain. They've basically said by 2040, no new sales. The, the, the analysts, the auto analysts say, don't worry, it's going to happen well before that because the, the batteries are improving. We're going to be 2025 as the kind of cutoff point where people will choose to buy an electric car rather than a, assuming we build the power stations to, to, to run those cars, obviously. Um, well, what's your view about when, when we reach peak oil, when, when essentially it, it starts? You know, you have, uh, so it was a peak oil in terms of supply, and now it, today it's a peak oil in terms of demand. Uh, what we, I believe, in fact, all that is not uh, black and white. I mean, uh, and by the way, the vision you just described is a very, uh, is a Western world vision. It's not the global vision. In this world, I would just try to remind some fundamentals. The demand for kilometers for transportation, year after year, is growing by 3.5% worldwide. You have plenty of people on this planet who do not have access to a car. And their dream is just to stop walking on the foot or with bicycles. You know. And we should not forget that fundamentally, the energy world is not governed by the vision of the OECD countries. We are mature countries in terms of energy consumption. The energy world is governed by what is happening in the emerging countries. And in these countries, there are some fundamental needs. These people today, their huge priority is to have access to energy, to have access to cheap energy. This could be combined with another objective, which is the clean energy. And in particular in China, in big cities where you have a local pollution, which is becoming a health issue, a social issue, there is a drive for some vehicle, electric cars. But I can tell you, China is important, but you have plenty of other countries in the world where this world does not, is but not China, China. I will not contest, so I will continue. Then I would like just to remind some people uh, I'm also very surprised, but today everybody, you know, we buy a battery company. We bought a battery company. And I'm very surprised when I read that we have discovered the ultimate battery uh, <laughs> technology with lithium ion, which has, I can tell you, a complex technology. It's a technology which to be, uh, it's uh, electrochemistry, but uh, you have some, uh, to be controlled by a lot of electronics. And year, each year, you have in this world a plant of lithium-ion battery, which is gone, just going to fine, to be fine, every year in the world, somewhere. So it's not so easy. I'm not sure we have today really have the right battery technology. Then I will take you. We took. A, we just published a scenario to oblige ourselves to say what happens if, in the world, 50% of the uh, personal uh, cars, like cars. <laughs> by 2040, are, are EVs, Elect this which is the most aggressive scenario which has been published. 50% of the stock, not the new cars, no, yeah? 50% no. of the it stock. It represents, it represents 8 million barrel of oil per day, which would be avoided. What is it? Eight. eight. Out, out of 100. If you took half the cars, yeah, it represents eight. Eight, eight, 10% yeah, of, of course, the market. Of course, because the, the today, in fact, people, uh, the global, the global use of oil for personal cars is something like 20, 25 million barrels. And you have some improvements. So it's not, a lot of oil is used for by heavy, uh, heavy transportation, by trucks, then by car. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it's not only EVs. EVs is part of the issue and I, part of the solution. And I'm convinced this technology will really emerge. And I'm ready. We have published this scenario, which is very aggressive. No problem. But the message is that you still have plenty of use 
of oil. And by the way, you know, EVs, if it's power, how do you do power? You do power either through gas or through uh, renewables. This is why, by the way, Total is investing in gas and, and renewables, renewables to yeah, make power. Yeah, you know, so yeah, yeah. it's a question of global edge. We, um, we should talk about some of the parts of the world that you're, that you're operating in, which are you know, fascinating and, and could occupy an hour of, of, of interview on their own. Um, let's start with Iran, because you are Surprise. doubling down on your bets in Iran. You are investing in Iran. You are committed to the country. It's billions. It's over five billion over five years. Is that right? No, 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 no. More. Boldness does not mean temerity. Let me be clear. No, we signed a contract in July, which represent a global investment for the partners of uh, $5 billion um, on 10 years. There is a first phase which represents $2 billion. So for total, it's $1 billion. We have 50%. Okay. So we will invest $1 billion. And the financial exposure, and in fact, the second phase of the contract, contract will be financed through the revenues of the first phase. So in fact, the global exposure for total will be, will be $1 billion. Right. Okay. And not five. So, okay, so we will which is more reasonable, and by the way, which is, uh, but I've done, it's not just to be uh, to hide our decision. I think you know it was uh, for me uh, a win-win decision. Uh, I didn't see where why we should have uh, uh, not taken that decision. In fact, uh, you know when you want to innovate, when you are the first, you have a chance to innovate. When you innovate, you can take the prize, you know, and you can have the best contract. We were very convinced that if we were being the first to, to negotiate with Iran, to create the Iranian petroleum contract, which we have done, in fact, we'll have a good chance to have, at the end, a, I would say, a profitable contract. Yeah. And this one clearly is matching because we were clear that we had to balance the risks by the rewards. Then we have, to, we have, of course, to do that in a legal framework, which is the one which is imposed to us by the US uh, primary sanctions. The secondary sanctions have been lifted. Right. So the but there are sanctions, still sanctions. Which means that don't, do not use dollars and do not have any US persons involved. I have one chance in total. We are a major company. We don't have too many US persons in the company. You know, it's a strange company. We are, but we are, don't have so many US assets, and we are able to make a frontier without any Americans being involved. Uh, but what about uh, dollars? It's very difficult to do uh, big global business without dollars. And so that's one advantage, which all my peers do not have. Uh, <laughs> dollars is, uh, dollars, in fact, let be clear. Uh, we, uh, and I, I want to clarify that, when we finance a, a development of a field upstream business like this one, we do that on equity. We do not use project financing in total, and neither of my peers. Uh, to finance uh, upstream developments. So, in fact, equity, my equity is in euro, so I don't, I mean, uh, so it's done. And if, uh, if I, uh, we are looking to other projects in Iran like petrochemicals, this would have to be financed by project financing. But we know, thanks to the Russians, on, the sanctions on Russia, we discovered that there is a world which is able to finance without, uh, to make project financing without dollars, it's China. We have been obliged to go to Chinese banks. They have plenty of euros, these banks. I don't know what the Central Bank of China is full of euros. <laughs> it's full of euros. And dollars. And so, by the way, the dollars I don't want. They keep the dollars. <laughs> they have also plenty of yuan, but the yuan we don't like because we cannot edge yuan, so the yuan will leave them apart. But you know, we, we finance our Yamal Energy projects in Russia for project financing organized with China's development bank in but Europe. On, this means so it's possible, you can do it. But this means the Americans are losing out on the that weakening that, no, that the reserve that, uh, status you know, of the... When you have difficulties, you innovate, you know? Frankly, in total, none of us had the idea to go to China to make a project financing. We were forced to discover all these worlds. And so project financing on Yamal was quite... Uh, I see Mike Ball worked on it, difficult one, because even we had to educate our Chinese banking system, what does it mean, the project financing? How do you structure it? So we have been through all that. And at the end of the day, uh, we discovered that there is, it's possible, and again, to finance a project without using dollars and without involving 
financial, uh, financial circuit in dollars. Okay. So maybe it's a new world, but this world, and by the way, I think what we have discovered there will help Total to be developed in the future because uh, with what is happening today and the position of uh, the US, it opens the way to the Chinese, uh, to China, to be more and more important in the world business. Yeah. When, you, when you go to Iran, is it Total doing that, or is it the French state? No, it's Total. But Total, you, talk, you talk to Total, me. I will take care of it. We don't have a single share no, of you, the no, French they, state. No, they, they, no, no, but I mean, but you talk to everybody Macron thinks. No, you no, talk to no, 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 no I don't talk. No, no, no. I took. We took <laughs> your decision by ourselves on our own. Uh, it's all decision. It's okay. all my idea. Yeah. No, no. It's very clear. I can tell you a decision like Iran. It's commercial. It's commercial right. decision. It's not geopolitical. But, but there not, is a lot. Then, of, of course, we, we there perfectly. There is geopolitics know. involved, isn't there? Yeah, no, there's yeah, a lot yeah, at yeah. the moment in Iran around the deal. Yeah, yeah. But um, uh, we don't ask the people to uh, do. We have the right or not to do it. We do it and we inform them, which is different. Right. And then the and then the, <laughs> and then the journalists and uh, are begin speaking about geopolitics. That's the reality. No, but okay. That's the reality. It happened like but that. Let's talk about. Of course, the... I'm polite, so I took my phone and just <laughs> tomorrow I'm going to Tehran, you know, and I will <laughs> sign tomorrow. That's that's the reality. The way it works. There are some politics. I mean, I mean, not no. Let me be clear. In the field of oil and gas, there is a, a sovereign dimension in this business. Because we are developing, we are producing the sovereign rights of this country. So from, from a producing country like Congo, like uh, United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Iran, this is for them fundamental because part of the wealth of the country relies in these natural resources. Yeah. So the question for them is, who do they trust as their partner to produce and to develop these resources? And this were we total have to be first excellent in our business. And this is where I continue to answer you. We are seen, we are perceived as a French nationality. Right, right. And I recognize, and I think it's a strength for us today, Total is perceived in most of these countries as representing France. And France as a soft power, because France is a member of the Permanent Council of the United Nations as a voice in all the geopolitical dimension. And so we benefit, even if we are a commercial company, of this position of France, which is, by the way, generally in diplomacy, tries to find its own uh, original way. You know, uh, so you're French so, when it really no, works but, for So you, really. when people ask me, do you have a nationality, I, I say yes. I have, we have a total as a nationality, a and this nationality is a strength in this world of oil and gas business. Okay. Now, look, I did want, I just want to get to the deal because, uh, I mean, what happens if, in, uh, how many days are there left? I mean, Trump initiated this process in which Congress is going to review the deal. Where's it all going? What happens? Well, you know, it's easy. Huh? Either I can or I cannot. Huh? Uh, <laughs> I mean, we are waiting to see what the U.S. Congress will decide. What could be a new framework of US sanction? Do they decide to put back the secondary sanction? Do they? And then we will take some, probably some advice right. of lawyers, because we are professional, and then we'll decide. And we are committed, but if we cannot legally pursue, we'll have to stop. Uh, but uh, we will not give up like that. You and know? the Iranians, and, uh, do and they? And you, you probably noticed that we signed in July, and we will be grandfathered compared to any decision all of the US. Do so, the, I mean, we'll do see. Do the Iranians express to you worries about your no. contract having to be? No, no, the Iranians, we have been very against the question of royalty. We have been very clear with Iran that we were able to sign mm -hmm. the contract, but we are willing to execute. And by the way, the work continues to move on despite this 60 day period. We, don't, we did not interrupt, the tenders are going on. We'll get the results of all the tenders, because in fact we have to commit for the big money by January, uh, beginning of next year, so we are in a comfortable position. Thanks to all this process initiated by President Trump, in fact it will give us even more clarity on what is a framework. So we are committed to do that, but they also know that if we, uh, we cannot, because there is a decision of the US, we could impact if it is a company, we'll say, we'll tell them we cannot do it. Having said that, we also know that the European countries, uh, plus Russia, plus China, uh, as long as the uh, International uh, Nuclear Agency 
declares that Iran is compliant, is not willing to abdicate. But you know, fundamentally, I'm, 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 I'm optimistic because what I spent, we spent a lot of time, I spent myself a lot of time in Washington before to sign to understand what were the strengths in Washington. And fundamentally, I think that uh, you have a lot of people and uh, the declaration of John Mattis and Rex Tillerson in the Senate, they declared, both of them, recently, one month ago, it is in national interest of the United States mm -hmm. to maintain the nuclear agreement, which is very strong. So, and I so think- So the incentive will be to find so, some token thing to change to, for domestic reasons. But there is a domestic that. reason. Maybe yeah. it will be to try to initiate another agreement on ballistic, uh, which obviously the Iranians are nervous about it. Uh, and by the way, you know, if I think the Europe and the Europe plus and the US want to engage Iran in a ballistic negotiation, the answer of Iran will be why not? But then you have to consider the whole region of the Middle East because the ballistic weapons are not in Iran. 90% of the ballistic weapons are in Saudi Arabia and in the UAE. Mm -hmm. So you could open another debate, right. about, <laughs> which is maybe an interesting debate for the, I would say for the peace and for the, of this Middle East region, which is quite fundamental. Which is, uh, which is frankly today going step after step to, towards more dislocation. So maybe it could be an, a debate, but let's be, I mean, I, don't, I refuse to make some politic, fiction, politic fictions because I think it's are so many possibilities of, of text which could be enacted by the US Congress. So it's difficult to envisage yeah, all the solution. So. For more side, we are committed, but at least my duty and the board of directors of Total Duty, of course, is also to take care of the interest of the company and if we think the risks are too big, we'll give up. But uh, I, I don't think so. I think we are. And by the way, I will conclude on it. Whatever will happen, I'm convinced that the Iranians will remember that we are bold enough to sign this contract, to come there. Right. And that, you know, in their minds, if Total was the first to sign, if because 20 years ago, we already done that with them. And in this business, because again, it's a matter of sovereign rights, Loyalty and, uh, is very important. History is very important. That's a, a very and important. I, I think it's a message. It's not only a matter of dollars and Excel files and IRR and profitability. It's also a matter of uh, behavior. Total is born in the Middle East in 1924 in Iraq. And I think the company is organized to manage this type of, of, uh, of pioneer spirit, of pioneer... Uh I'm going to ask decisions. you one last one, Patrick, and then I'm going to open to the floor because I know people here will have more questions than I've got, and I've only got through two-thirds of mine, um, which is Saudi Arabia, because something really quite big seems to be happening in Saudi Arabia. Crown Prince bin Salman is obviously something of a reformer, a sort of Gorbachev trying to, 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 to change uh, the, the, the dysfunctional regime there. Um, are you optimistic about that? I mean, I observe, like you, I was in Riyadh this year, this week. I observed that uh, there was a big, uh, big show. Uh, you don't change, I think, uh, uh, like that. Uh, it's a secular regime, like uh, Saudi Arabia. The young prince clearly has a vision. Uh, you have a young population. You have 70% of the population in Saudi Arabia are under 30 years old. So I think he speaks to them. The question is, does he speak also to all the all elder ones? That's maybe less obvious. Uh, it could be a big change. Uh, I think it's uh, probably uh, uh, the future of Saudi Arabia is uh, probably a, a fundamental element of the future of the region. But it's difficult to say today I'm, we are optimistic or not optimistic. You know, you compare them to Gorbachev. Do you remember what happened? Mr. Gorbachev. <laughs> it's you, not me. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, there was a coup, yeah, and he, he lost, his, lost his job. Um, we'll, um, we'll open up to the floor. I've, I've, no, we, it opens a period of chaos after, which you have to, after, before, to go back to stabilization. It's not a question of personal power. Right. If, when you have a country like this one, but others, you know, this is what we have observed in many North Africa countries what we call the Spring Revolution. You know. uh, when you open, uh, I don't know what is the, uh, in coconut minute, aide moi, uh, Mike. Open a can of worms, yeah, can of worms. Yeah, yeah, yeah when yeah. you open that, 
<laughs> your pressures go up, yeah, yeah. You, you freeze the uh, pressure, and you don't know where it goes, you know? Right. And uh, generally, you have some period of chaos after, right. which could be... As they know uh, in France, of course, from the... Uh, no, no, we have no chaos, we have no chaos 17, in France 1789, today, uh, I'm thinking. No, 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 <laughs> we have... Uh, we have no, well, but it was a positive one, this one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's take some... Um, I know that you miss this one in, in Great Britain. You should have that in Great Britain as well. Uh, 1789, I think it would be good for your country. <laughs> we'll take, we've got some roving mics. If you would just say who you are, we'll take the gentleman there. His hand was up first. And um, we haven't spoken about Brexit. We haven't spoken about French politics, so you can raise them or I will as well. Yes. No, but you have the right to ask a question you want, not the one you want. Yeah, no, no, you, you can ask me. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm going to ask my question, not his. Yeah. Hello, I'm David Pollock of Concilium Capital and a member of Chatham House. Clean and affordable energy is part of your mission. Would you like to talk more about your ambitions for yeah. that in solar and energy storage? Even yeah. I see you've invested in off-grid access to energy yeah. in Africa. Where, 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 where do you want to take that, and how big will it be overall? Well, you know, I think, uh, but the, third, uh, the word I use are reliable, which is access, affordable, and clean. I always explain in my speech that we should not make a mistake. The most important mission is the first two, giving access to energy to people at the cheapest possible price. This is what the people are looking for. Then we have the other challenge, the climate change challenge. The way we look at it in the company is to be uh, very pragmatic. You know. Uh, it's, in fact, when you speak about climate change, you speak about evolution of our markets. I mean, what will be the energy markets in 20, 30 years? And so we spend some time to look to the various scenarios, not all scenario, because you know, in an old company, it's very difficult to explain that all will, be, will peak, you know. It's, uh, dramatic for a company like us, peak oil, you know, what is it? So forget all our scenarios. We took the international energy essential scenario, two degree one. And we look at it. And what, what does it mean, this two degree scenario? First, that in 20 years, or let's take 2040, 25, 2050, we should be 9 billion instead of 7 billion. And the first remark, which look to that scheme, we should consume globally in the world only 10% more than today, which is incredible. Because today you have 7 billion people, 1.3 do not have access to energy. If we want to be on the two degree roadmap, we should only consume 10% more of global energy, which means, in fact, a huge effort of energy efficiency. And if maybe you notice that recently we began to acquire some company in the field of energy efficiency, because there is there a big business to be developed if we want to be on the two degree. Then you look to what will be the energy in 2040, 2050. Compared to today, today you have 80% of coal, 30% coal, 30% oil, 20% gas, 80% of hydrocarbons, of fossil fuels. In 2040, 2050, you still have some fossil fuels, around 50%. Coal should diminish to 10, oil to 20%, and gas around 20, 25%. Good news is that you still have oil and gas. Huh? So for my company, it's not desperate. Me. And by the way, I would like to, to mention that because people, uh, we still have coal in our energy mix. I just described you the energy mix of today is 30% coal. The large share is coal. Coal seems to us the energy of the past. We went to coal at the beginning of the 20th century. And 150 years after, we are still with plenty of coal. And by the way, if we were able to eliminate, to replace all this coal-fired power plant on this planet and just replace it by gas-fired power plant, we would be immediately on the two-degree scenario. Immediately. It's a dream, but it's feasible without going to plenty of new technologies. So why did I say that? Because people forget, again, energy is fundamental. And, all, and so, and why do we have coal today in the energy mix? But because it's cheap. It is the cheapest energy. Because again, the world is driven by affordable energy. This is a primary concept because energy is at the core of any socioeconomic development. So to continue, you have oil, you have gas, and then you have renewable for 30% in uh, for 30, 40%. So what did we decide internally? We say to ourselves, okay, we want to be responsible. We want Total to continue to be a major player in 25, 20, 30 years. So all markets will evolve, the, the oil will peak, so there will be no more growth in oil. 
The gas could continue to grow. I we strongly believe that the gas is the flexible energy to be combined with renewables, but renewables will also <coughs> develop. Renewables, and not only renewables, what I call the low carbon business, which implies energy storage. Because if you think to renewables, if you are not able to store energy, you lose a huge amount of money. We, we invested first in Sun Power, a solar company, and we discovered very quickly that without being able, as long as we are not able to store the energy, it's why we invested then in SAF. The economic model was not really sustainable on the renewable part. So we say to ourselves, okay, let's be, let's use it, let's be serious, let's be responsible, let's begin to prepare that future. And in fact, globally speaking, you know, we generate 20 billion dollar of cash flows per year today. We decided to allocate 500 to 1 billion dollar to this low carbon business right. to build on. So today we have five, six billion of assets, and the ambition is to have 20 percent of the portfolio. Which does not mean that we will not continue to grow on oil and gas. It's compatible, and gas more than oil, by the way. But it's just trying to, to prepare the future of this energy world to continue to be a major company in 20, 30 years. That's, that's the ambition we have. Okay. And I think it is the right speech that the oil and gas company should develop. We, we should not be seen as the industry of the past, which is fully wrong. We, we need oil and gas. But we also need to be responsible, and best answer is to invest part of our cash flows in this new energy. This is the answer we should bring to the world. And to be, and not to have, to be, to have shame, to, sh to have shame to produce oil and gas. We are very proud of that. Right, we'll take a uh, gentleman here in the front row and then the, um, the woman with the hand up over there. Yeah, okay. <coughs> yeah, so sorry, this gentleman, I was actually gonna be this gentleman. Okay, go on, Jeremy, yeah, go on. Uh, Jeremy Greenstock, chairman of Lambert Energy Advisory. Uh, thank you. It's for your fascinating comments so far. I'm interested in your view of developments in the United States. Do you see their concentration on unconventional oil and gas, all the investments going into that, but each field is really quite short-lived, so it's, it's not a, a huge cash flow, cash flow generator in the United States. Do you see them, from the total point of view, as becoming less competitive in the international upstream because of their focus on domestic? No, I mean, I mean uh, clearly, uh, uh, you have, that's true, that you have some, a lot of US independents are refocusing on the US. They consider it's their garden. Uh, by the way, they are probably very good in, 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 be, in, in, in able to, uh, to manage operations in these uh, fields. It's a good news for us. That means that they are less aggressive outside of the US, so I'm happy to see that. This is why we bought the Maersk Oil, by the way. Uh, we bought Maersk Oil because for me, uh, it was a, 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 an excellent move uh, to play to our strengths, which means conventional offshore, North Sea offshore, where you have plenty still of resources, where you can continue to lower the cost by making synergies. And I'm very convinced that Total is much more able to add value on Maersk Oil than developing fields in the US where we have a little added value compared to all this ecosystem, which is quite efficient. I mean, I recognize, I'm, I'm, I'm very, to be clear for me, it's, a, it's an incredible success story what is happening in the US with all these unconventional. These guys are really impressive, very efficient. Uh, and for us, it's just that we, I don't see what are our strengths to compete with them in the US. But we are investing in the US more in the downstream part. We want to transform all this uh, feedstock and low-cost energy in petrochemicals, in LNG. So you will see, we have a beginning to do. And Total is investing quite a lot in the US, but not in upstream. Uh, for another reason, by the way, is that the cost of access to the resource is very expensive. So I put the land. Work. The yeah. land is very expensive. And so I, as we don't inherit, we don't are not, uh, yeah. it's very difficult to make business if you pay uh, the land as, at the cost of today. Mm -hmm. But again, I, I, I can understand that my, I would be a CEO of a US major company. I think I would lose a, a lot in the US. I mean, it would be my, my, my own kind. I mean, my, I would, it would be one of my strengths, so I would do that. Right, we had a woman in the third row. We'll very, go there, and then young, we'll go to the young lady. gentleman who I thought I was pointing at before. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Monsieur Pouyanné. Uh, Hélène Clémenceau from Africa Matters. 
Um, I was wondering what would be your advice for an African government who has just uh, found newly found resources like Senegal or Cote d'Ivoire on how to manage those resources. Thank you. Uh, that's, uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm not a government. Uh, I'm not a government, but I think, uh, you know, again, it's, uh, we should take lessons from Norway. <laughs> Uh, but there is a big difference. In Norway, you don't have so many people. They are already uh, uh, quality of life. Uh, in these countries, it's, uh, it's but true that you have a sort of, you, you can ask yourself, why uh, is it so complex to have new countries to oil and gas, to be able to take the most of, of the resources in favor of the development of the country? We have one example where we work today, it's Uganda. Uganda is a new country to oil. One of the difficulties we face is that you have too many crocodiles, you know, in the lakes. So you need to find the crocodiles, you know. And I think one of the duties for us is to, to, not to accept anything which is wrong for the country, which takes time. If in Uganda we take time, it's because we want the things to be done in the right way. And it will be done. Do some oil companies... It will be done in the right way. Do some companies... You can think of companies that have controversial investments in Africa. Do, do you think some oil companies look after themselves more than the country they're working in? No, but I mean, <laughs> let's be clear. We have to, a, when you negotiate a contract, uh, you have a question of, of do you share the revenues? Yeah. Of course, we try to optimize the share of the revenues. But the question which is asked is not, is not the split of the revenues between oil companies and state. The question which is asked is what the state are doing with their money which is honestly not my, my job, not our, not our job. We can, what we have to be sure is that all the money we give them is going to, uh, to the central bank of the country. After that, it's up to, I mean, we are not in charge in our company to say what is right and what is wrong in terms of allocation of the resources we provide to the states. Okay. I will take uh, that one down here yeah. and then, I'm going to go over there because I've been unfair to that side of the room, and then we'll, yeah, so. Charles de Croisset, Goldman Sachs. Uh, you mentioned that you had made an investment in electrical store, in storage of electricity. Indeed, you bought a very fine company, but uh, it's relatively, sm in, in relative to the market, it is relatively small. You are, it was also reminded to us by Eva Davis, a very big player in oil and gas. Uh, do you intend uh, strategically to become a very big player in this major industry of the future, electricity storage, or was that just uh, to put your foot in the water? No, no, I mean, it's, uh, it's difficult today to say what will be the ambition, you know, and uh, it's still an infant industry, you know, and uh, we have uh, acquired this company. They may have a lot of technological know. They make profits, which is good, you know. Uh, they make profits, so it's a profitable company. It's not big, I fully agree. Uh, at least there was one advantage is that because we have acquired that company, we are much more serious to understand all these and we spend some time, which helps us to understand the dynamic of, our, of the markets. We, have the, we are looking to, with them uh, at the, what is the level of growth we can have, in particular in stationary uh, storage for renewables. Frankly, I, would, I have a doubt, even if I know that all the European governments are dreaming of the battery Airbus, so I don't know which uh, concept. Uh, it's not a company which is designed to make mass, mass market for car, for, car, for battery for cars. I'm afraid, like that for Europe, we'll see the same story that in, uh, you know, in solar panels and that the Chinese uh, battery manufacturers will take the most of this, of this business. And by the way, when you read to what the car European car manufacturers uh, explain today, uh, most of their strategy, they say they consider that the battery is a sort of commodity. They want to invest in the electronic of control, the battery management system, but they consider that they, they have their duty, they, they will want to buy the battery at the cheapest possible price. I'm not sure that the European company is the best position to be able to develop that product in the, in the worldwide competition. So uh, we'll see, but we have some ambition, and 
uh, if we can grow it at this size. I mean, it's, uh, all that is capitalistic, so we need to understand exactly where we put our fingers, you know. It's a fascinating area of batteries, and, and, and we need another kind of breakthrough, really, to get, get up a level, I think. Uh, so we had a gentleman over here. Yep, keep your hand up, so the mic will come around to you. Dominic Carradu from Rabobank. Um, clearly, as you say, you're a commercial company rather than a political or geopolitical company. But with investments in Iran, in Saudi or whatever, you, you can't avoid being caught up in some of the politics. And that may be indirectly you know, vis-a-vis -vis Trump or whatever. Just behind you, you've got the map of the world. I mean, do you guys ever get concerned about, you know, again, BP and Shell had issues at time in Russia. Um, you've got a more assertive China. Um, do you guys play scenarios about sequestration of assets or even a, an outbreak of conflict in Asia? No, but you know, um, um, first of all, I, I, we do not decide where you find oil and gas. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have that power. <laughs> and unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know, but uh, it seems that uh, you have... Uh, it's very concentrated, you know. 80% of the oil resource or the gas resource are only in eight countries. So looking to the geography, where do you find oil and gas, is something which struck, always struck me. With eight countries in oil, eight in gas are not exactly the same. Turkmenistan is one of the gas, uh, it's not in oil. Uh, you have 80%. So, you know, to make the strategy of a major company like Total, if you decide not to go to all the risky places of this world, you stay in the US, but I'm not in the US, you know? And <laughs> even, even maybe in the US you have some risk, you know? You never know. You have at least a legal risk that BP experienced dramatically for them uh, some years ago. And, uh, so no, you have risk everywhere. Having said that, what do we do? In fact, we have a sort of, uh, it's the, one of the advantage, we have a major company, a major portfolio, we have $150 billion of assets, is that in fact, we, we manage a company so that Whatever happens in one country, it will not damage the company. So we look to what is the capital employed. There is, no, it's not, there is no official rule in the company because we don't want the teams to stop being creative in any country. So we let them generating ideas. But at the top of the company, with the board of directors and myself, we look to the way we spread the risk. And in fact, we spread the risk. And so you don't find any country in my portfolio, maybe one, which have more than $10 billion of capital employed. And even if we lose $10 billion out of 150, the company will survive. And so I think this is the, the question we raise. So, uh, and, uh, and then, of course, the duty is to try to take, uh, to take maximum. And, but again, you, you cannot, uh, uh, you have to generate ideas, to, so it's spreading the risk about many countries the way we manage that. BP lost more than 10 billion in uh, the United States, actually. Didn't 65 they? billion. Yeah. So, do you That's know, the risky, the risky country is maybe not Russia. Uh, it, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 65 they, they, billion, were, were, which is quite incredible, by the way. Were they, were they ripped off by the United States on that? Was it, was it fair that they paid that much for that, I mean, for, uh, for that, for that accident? But I, I mean, uh, I would not have to any problem. You know, you have already, I already have Iran with the US. If I'm adding <laughs> some comments in BP, uh, I will finish. No, but I mean, no, but I mean, let me clear. I think none of us, frankly, none of us would have imagined that a, a, a well, uh, a well could generate a loss. Even, you would have asked me the question before my condo, I think I would have put two, three billion dollars, which we experienced, you know, when we had the dramatic event like the Erika uh, uh, spill, uh, I think it cost a total three billion dollars, or euro or something like that. So none of us had that in mind. So 65 billion is it's obviously absolutely enormous, but you know where we are. Very unfortunate, you have the CNN Live, you know, CNN yeah, Live. Yeah. You have the legal system in the US, which is why I say the legal risk in the, in the US for me exists really. You know, in all of files in the US, we are wrong on one thing. We always underestimate the level of fines that we have to pay just to finance the US administration. <laughs> which is the reality. But, but that's a, I don't know why people, it's a reality today. We have a refinery in the Texas, and each year we have some, uh, some fines 
And the people will explain us, but we have to finance. We don't have the money from the Congress, you know? We have to finance <laughs> our, our office, so let's have... And that's a permanent game where you are accused to do absolutely crazy things. You have just one microgram of SOX, blah, 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 and you must pay $2 million, and, which is out of order. And so what happens is that the lawyers just recommend you, you have to negotiate and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and so you spend your five, six million per year of uh, having the right to operate in the US. So it's a strange, and frankly, this is what I call the legal reason. Unfortunately, our colleagues of BP experienced that at a huge scale, which is absolutely incredible. And uh, this is why we are all prudent uh, to be yeah, sure, but uh, which why, by the way, today, when you think about the US Gulf of Mexico, deep water, uh, you don't have so many players today. And uh, we could be one of them, but we are always to, to think what could be the consequences. You're, you know, you're the second uh, biggest operator in the North Sea after the Maersk, yeah. um, Maersk takeover. Yeah. Um, Brexit, is that a... Is, is that Larger than my two uh, UK and Dutch peers. So number one is Statoil, and just to, to be... Right. And, and, and is Brexit a big corporate risk for you? I mean, we hear a lot about the auto industry. We hear a lot about financial services. We don't hear much about the offshore. No, but you know, because in fact, uh, there is a huge difference because we are not local businesses, you know. We, we, we produce oil, we, we export it. So the, the implications for us of the Brexit on our core business is quite, quite minimum, in fact. So, in fact, we do not depend really upon the local condition. We, is not a, we are not a car manufacturer which has a plant in UK yeah, to export chain. it to Europe. Yeah, yeah. So, in fact, we are on world markets. It's a little difference in gas. So, for us, in fact, it's, it's for Total, it's not a, obviously, it's not a major issue. It's more an issue because we are a European company and so it, impact, it has an impact on the global European dynamic, which is more, uh, I mean, as a European major company, uh, could have some impact, but uh, um, we are not. I don't consider we have a. I think it's a huge mistake, but I don't consider it's a, it's an issue for the group. Right. Okay. Okay. We'll take another couple of questions. I said, um, yeah, we'll take the gentleman with the beard over in, towards the end. They keep your hand up if you've got a beard, and then. Uh, <laughs> we'll. okay. Thank you, Carlos Tornero, responsible investor magazine. Uh, I know Total is in favor of um, carbon pricing. So I would like to ask you, Mr. Pujane, what would you do to improve it? And uh, also on the back of uh, the Paris Agreement, uh, I wonder if Total measures actively stranded, stranded assets that the, the company won't be able to, to use in the future. No problem. Uh, first question, uh, just to have a real system, you know. Uh, there is no, I mean, there is no miracle. You need to put a floor somewhere in the system. You need to have a real central banker of the CO2 pricing. ETS will never work. It will never work. Because there is no regulator. There is no independent regulator. You know, today, the way it's working, it's a council of ministers. And uh, by the way, it will not work. Look. So the right way to do it is what UK has done. What did UK say? We put a tax of 18 pounds per, per, per ton. 18, one eight, not 100. Don't afraid everybody. And just the full system of UK power shifted from coal to gas. So it's not so complex if you want to do it. But I suspect you have a lot of people who do not want to do that in Europe. So we have with five euro per ton and uh, we continue to do it. So I think it's a, uh, you have to put a floor, and I think you have to delegate the system to a, a central banker or central control, an independent one, who has one objective. What is the objective? To have a price above 15 euro per ton. Let's begin by 15. Let's not afraid people. You know, we made I had this discussion uh, with Nicolai Hulot. I told him, don't speak about 50, 100 euro. Nobody will listen to you. <laughs> no, but frankly, you're afraid everybody because you have some manufacturing industries in Europe who want to maintain their activity. You know, in total, we are, we are refiners. We are petrochemicals. I was the head of refining and chemicals before to become CEO. I was fully against the price of carbon pricing. <laughs> when I became CEO, I realized after two months it was a big mistake. I told to my colleague, no, 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 we need to be in favor of carbon. So sometimes, you know, even the smartest guys could make mistakes, you know. And so I said, no, 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 no. We have to be in favor because it's gas against coal. It's just a future of energy markets. Let's be in favor of carbon pricing. 
and refining and look refiners and we made the full balance I made the, all the calculation and we had a big advantage to have some carbon but it has to be reasonable so let's begin at 15 let's go quick step after step Walk and that's why run yeah. yeah and I think the UK frankly on that UK has just demonstrated to the world what you have to do so let's take the good ideas where you can find them uh, on the second one yes stranded asset Stranded asset, again, it's a concept of a long-term asset. You know, when we develop an oil field today, most of the oil field we will develop in Uganda, I just mentioned, in Brazil, are, in fact, produced at 90% in 10, 15 years. They will not be stranded. So we made the calculation, which was us, and we have issued, a, we were the first, it's the second edition, a climate report, without being obliged by that, I don't know which, uh, task force, or I don't know what. We have done it ourselves, you know. Uh, one year ago, in 16, I asked my colleagues, let's, let's, and in that paper, you find a calculation, we made the math, what happens if in 19, 2040 or 2030, and we see that we could have an impact of five to 10% on the value of the company, we published it. So I think it's a question of duration, of course. This is why it's difficult, by the way, to make plenty of scenarios, and what we don't want on that is, uh, is that to be forced to make scenarios which would be uh, different for the companies and which could impact, which could have a, a give a, a wrong information to investors. But no, I think on this matter again the same philosophy: the oil and gas industry has everything to win, to be transparent and to say the things and to put that on the table. I think we are in a world of the 21st century. We cannot hide and think that because we hide the things, people will be convinced. They are not convinced at all. So let's speak. Let's pick up and let's explain what we do. So we don't have so many stranded assets. This is why I'm ready to discuss about stranded assets because when you look at the portfolio of Total, an asset which will last more than 30 years or 20 years, I don't have so many. I would love to have more than that, but I don't have enough. You know? <laughs> okay, I'm going to let, we're going to overrun by four minutes because I, we, we started four minutes late. Who wants to have the last question? Yes, gentleman over there. Mike, come to you. Just coming to you behind you. There we go. Uh, Niall Henderson from BP. Um, when your peer, uh, Ben Van Burden, recently spoke, he said his next car would be an electric one. Can I ask you what type of car your next car will be? No, no, I'm using a normal car. Hybrid? Uh, a hybrid car. Hybrid. I on. think the right answer, by the way, is hybrid. Yeah. Hybrid car is the right answer. I would be, I, I said that to, um, to, to uh, again, the French minister. I told him, you make a, I think I would not have done 2040 only electric cars. I would have done 2025 hybrid cars. This would have been much more efficient. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This would save a lot of pollution in our towns. This is the right technology to use it on. And I would have forced that by being, by the way, you know, when you began to have a law which describes what is a technology to use in 20 years, I think it's absolutely nonsense. But the government, it's not the job of governments to decide what is the right technology. These technologies are moving much quicker than that. And, but the hybrid one is obviously the one. And you know, I'm struggling because my, as I'm a French, I say I have a French nationality, I asked my driver, okay, I want to have an hybrid car, but I want a French hybrid car. <laughs> <laughs> and they use, and so, and, and I am, you know, I'm tall, and to find a French hybrid car with a tall, for a tall guy, it does not exist. So I'm still, uh, but I will find one. I will be obliged to go maybe to a Japanese one, but Renault is linked, is linked to Japanese car manufacturing. Exactly. Even, uh, no, but uh, no, that's, that's the point. So hybrid. Uh, for me, hybrid is the solution, and I think the European governments and most of governments should be much more focused on that solution quickly. That's a really interesting and I think a very, uh, an absolutely compelling point. Now, look, just one last one before we go. Uh, Macron, how's he going to do? Is he going to succeed? You, you, you're a supporter of his? You, you know, is I'm he a, going to succeed where so many people have tried to take I France? Think, I mean, uh, what I'm sure is that we must support him to, to succeed. Because what happened in, uh, after the Brexit, after Trump elections, even in France of the first round. 50% voted of the first for round, the outside. Let's be clear, of the first round of the French election, 50% of the people voted against us. They voted against what we yeah. think is yeah. the right world, either extremists on the left or extremists on the right, 50%. So let's be clear, for an, a picture of company like Total, it's really something we, we need to, to take care of that. We need to be to take care against the battle territories. We cannot just say we are a world company, we are powerful, and I think there is, there is something which is it. So Emmanuel Macron managed to win through. 
I can tell you what he's done. I think he's, he's quite brave, frankly. Uh, the first labor law reform is really a reform. And we should not underestimate. It will take time, of course, but it's really a reform. The taxation reform, which is just taking place, is even more astonishing. You know, the flat tax at 30% of all capital income was, <laughs> we, were ta we were taxing that at 55%. So there are some fundamental things which are moving. It's driven, for the first time, I would say, since probably uh, uh, 1974, Giscard d'Estaing, we have a French president which will understand the economics and the business, and which is driven by the idea that he, wa he has to support the, the, the enterprise, the business, because they create a job. And the state does not create a job, which is very new. You know, we had 40 years with. So that's an advantage. Uh, I think is is good in uh, the French. I told you, people do not think they are a normal pe normal people. They <laughs> hate that. The idea that you are normal, they hate that. The French need to be proud. They are very proud of their history, of their culture, and I think it's playing on the right point. You know, finger point. All these diplomatic moves inviting Trump, Putin, all that, is making people, and they know what we expect from a politician at the end, is to create the trust. To create trust to people to consume, to trust to people to invest, that's what we expect from them. There is no miracle recipe, otherwise we would just apply the miracle recipe if it was easy to do. So I think he's trying to do that, of course. He's a young, he will make mistakes, like we all make mistakes, but we should give him the credit, and I think for us, if he does not succeed, I, I'm afraid the next uh, follow-up could be much more uh, complex for all our, for yeah. our, all uh, the way we live and the, the way. And so at a time where we see plenty of dislocation everywhere, including in Europe, the Catalonia story is incredible for me. Uh, I think, okay, he maybe he's trying. So let's see what he can do. He will not be able to do it alone. I hope that. Uh, Angela Merkel on Europe will be able to join his efforts with him. And I think that the both of them, with their, I would say, his dynamic and uh, their experience, they could do great things for Europe. Uh, but we need that. We need that because our continent, if we are not waking up very quickly, will disappear in front of China and the US. Thank you. That's a good note on which to finish. Look, Patrick, you've gone from uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran to France to, uh, to batteries, really a very, very broad canvas. And you've been very candid and very open with us. And we're very grateful. Can we thank Patrick Kaplan? <laughs>